friends, this is Pastor David Langford. It's such a great joy to be with you today. And I have with me in the studio, Brother Jimmy D. Smith. Glad to be here. And, and Brother Smith, it is such a great, great joy to have you with us in the studio today. I'm excited about the great things that, are, that God is doing. And of course, you're here today and going to be sharing with us from Psalms chapter 91. And uh, we're not going to waste a lot of time today because we're here to encourage people today, aren't we? Oh, yes. Um, I know with the COVID, the loss of jobs and people being sick and all other types of anomalies and aberrations, people are somewhat discouraged. Yeah. And uh, Christians need to be edified and they need to be comforted. And that is the purpose of the Word of God and the Holy Spirit. Yeah. He's the one that edifies the Holy Spirit. He comforts. And then, of course, we obtain great strength through the word of God. Psalm 68, 35 says, The God of Israel is he that giveth strength and power unto his people. So the word strengthens us. And of course, the Holy Spirit is all about the endowment of power. Amen. So you're going to be sharing today from Psalms chapter 91. Uh, I'm going to let you read that. And we're going to get right into the passages of God's word and just hopefully edify and encourage those who are watching today. Thank you, Pastor David. It is uh, a joy to be back with you. Uh, I'm not just sharing a, a picked out psalm. This is something that I read almost every day the last few months. Praise God. Uh, it's such a, an encouragement to me. I thought, well, we'll try to share that with people. Amen. And I'm going to read the entire psalm. And I'm not going to apologize for that because we need to catch up on our Bible reading. Amen. Amen. All right. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. He will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God, in Him will I trust. Surely, he shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the, uh, and from the uh, noisome pestilence. He shall cover thee with his feathers and under his wings shalt thou trust. He, his truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night nor for the sorrow or the arrow that flieth by day, nor for the pestilent that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. A thousand shall fall at thy side, and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. Only with thine eyes shalt thou behold and see the reward of the wicked. Because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the Most High, thy habitation. There shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thee, nigh thy dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall hear thee, uh, they shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. Thou shalt tread upon the lion and the adder, the young lion and the dragon shalt thou trample under feet, because he hath set his love upon me. Therefore, Will I deliver him? I will set him on high, because he hath known my name. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life will I satisfy him and shall and show him thy salvation. Wow. Amen. What a beautiful <laughs> description of the psalmist David talking about himself. And then he goes into the personage of God and talks about how God is going to edify him. 
keep him, protect him, and nurture him. That's the power of the inspiration of the Word of God. Oh, by all means. And you know, uh, I read recently that there's over a hundred different names of God. Wow. Uh, we're we're going to only touch on four of them today, but uh, the thought occurred to me that every time they learned something about God, and the more they learned about God, the more they had to give him more names because <laughs> he's a, as we'll see, he's a God of protection and a God of power and a, and a God of all, all these other things. And so they couldn't just name him one name. He right. had to have over a hundred. Right. He is, he is so vast. And of course, Christians miss out on so much concerning the Lord because they don't pursue him. You know, just like that whole psalm right there, a, a, a pastor you know very well could preach that psalm for a solid year or better. Oh, man, yeah. But there, there's so much in there. And as uh, Paul, the apostle, 2 Timothy uh, 3, 16, 17, said all scripture yeah. is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and instruction in righteousness, <laughs> that the man of God might be throughly furnished under every good work. So God throughly furnishes us. He, there's nothing lacking at the master's table. The salt, the pepper, the, yeah. the, the, the carbs, the, the beef, the protein, it's all at the table. And of course, the table is his word. Amen. Amen. I'm glad you said that because I struggled with this psalm because I, uh, I loved it so much. I researched a lot of it. And some say, that David wrote this psalm. Right. While others say, no, it was Moses that wrote the psalm. And many commentaries say it's an orphan psalm because it doesn't have an author. But the thought occurred to me that Eve, whether it be David or Moses, all Scripture is inspired by God. Amen. <laughs> so it's all God's Word. Absolutely. Regardless of who the author might be, because holy men of old was breathed upon by the Holy Spirit right. as they wrote these words. So that was just great. I thought, well, it could have been David. He went through a lot. Oh, he absolutely. was qualified to talk about trouble and how to make it during hard times. Uh, but so was Moses. Yes. He passed through the Wilderness Street Pentecostal Church uh, <laughs> there on the Wilderness <laughs> Avenue. <laughs> I mean, uh, you think about a million members FaceTiming you and texting you at all times. I imagine he got tired of hearing from all his members. But uh, regardless of who it was, all Scripture was uh, breathed upon by his Spirit upon men of old as they wrote the Scripture. That's what I think about yeah, that. Yeah, Second Peter one twenty one. For the prophets that came in the old time, not by the will of men, but holy men of God spake, as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. That's right. It, when the Bible says the Word of God is God inspired or God breathed, that's literally what happened. The inspiration of the Holy Ghost, as the Spirit of God unctionized them, they spoke these profundities. I mean, when you read the Bible, no mortal man can make these kind of statements without being led, unctioned, empowered by a greater authority. Oh. It's just, it's impossible. Uh, the, 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 the vast knowledge and revelation and insight, mortal men cannot obtain that on their own. No. You know, and I know you want to get into the names of God, but I want to say one thing here at the beginning of, of, of verse one in Psalms 91, verse one, he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Think about that. He that dwelleth, not an occasional visit, oh, uh, not yeah. a part-time visit, mm. not sometimes, or when I'm in trouble, I need to run to God. No. This psalmist is saying, I dwell with God. Mm. I dwell with, he dwells with me. In other words, God has a place of residence in my heart, and I'm dwelling with him. He's dwelling with me. And if we dwell with the Lord, none of these things can harm us. That's right. But if you're just a casual visitor when you're in trouble, when these arrows begin to fly and these pestilence begin to come, you may not be where you need to be. Oh, that's so rich. And in the word, uh, uh, the shadow. Yes. Uh, boy, there's a lot right there. We don't have time for 
to, for every word, but I could talk about every word. Shadow is a is a place of shade. Yes. Uh, you know, they say the a shadow can't hurt you, especially uh, a shadow of a dog, a mean dog. A shadow can't hurt you, but neither can a shade of God. Right. It is a resting place. It's a place that keeps the sun off your brow. There's all kinds of things you say about the shadow of God, but uh, yeah, and it talks about the dwelling place, and uh, people want to come to God during the time of a COVID-19 or whenever they go through a divorce or the bank account is down, the blood counts up, uh, too much month at the end of the money, whatever way you want to say it. Uh, but God is a dwelling place, yes, and we need to learn to dwell with him all the time, not just part-time. Amen. And to have a shadow, you have to have a light. That's Jesus exactly is that good. light. You, you, you can't have a shadow. You know, if you've been out of the yard and, and you, you can hear a big jet liner go over and you can see the shadow on the ground as it's moving because the airplane is moving. Right. But above the airplane is the sun. <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, and so oh. we are under that shadow That's because good. we're in the presence of God, which is the light. John 8, 12, I'm the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. As a Christian, I don't dwell in darkness. Uh-uh. You know, the, the world is dark. The world is lifeless and listless. God is life. He's vibrant. And we're in that dwelling place, that place of refuge under that shadow. We're in the divine presence of God, and how edifying is that? Oh man, that is so good, so good. You Amen. you have a way of putting a scripture on it, <laughs> uh, and oh, it's yeah, such a memory for the Word of God. And you always bless me with what you have to say. You want to talk about these four names? Hey, go right ahead, brother. All right, we'll I'm just gonna learn about... something from you today. No, I doubt that. <laughs> <laughs> I just sort of get to get you going, and then you minister to me and the people, but. Uh, the first word is the word most high in verse one. Uh, he that dwelleth in the secret place of the most high. That's the first word, most high. It's the Hebrew word Elon, and it means that God owns everything. Amen. He is the owner of it all. Everything above us, everything uh, beneath us. God owns it all. I used to say God uh, owns the trees, the bees, and the fleas, and the peas. I mean, he, <laughs> he owns everything. Amen. And, I mean, nothing uh, is here but what God didn't make it. And so the key word is possession. He possesses everything. Uh, you don't discover the moon. That was there before. That's right. God made it. You don't discover Mars. God made all of it. And he did it in the book of Genesis. You can see it all. I don't have time to read all of that. But God is the God of possession. He uh, owns it all. And, and how about that for a hiding place? Whenever you know that you serve a God, uh, John Phillips uh, calls this, he's uh, one of the uh, uh, commentary writers I read sometimes. John Phillips says that uh, this psalm is called the hiding place. And what better place to go whenever you are having tough times and hard times than to run to God who possesses all. In fact, when you read these four names, uh, it could be, and I get the idea that that God or the author is talking about God. God is our fortress. Amen. And the thought occurred to me, you don't go into the fortress with God. That's right. God is the fortress. He is the fortress. I mean, I don't know what better way you can say it, but it, it's very understandable that he is the fortress. And Psalm 91 verse 14, and it says, because he has set his love upon me, therefore will I deliver him. I will set him on high because he hath known my name. Amen. He takes us, a fortress is usually the highest place of, in military battle. 
Right. Uh, a fortress is up on a hill so you can see all the enemies around you. Amen. And, and God is saying, look, we're, we're not going into the fortress together. That's not what he's saying. When you go into the fortress, I am the fortress. Amen. Amen. <laughs> and, uh, and so it's, it's for, so good to see that this hiding place is a place to go to run to. And that's, it's, a, it's just a great place uh, to have in your heart that our God is, is our fortress. Not that we go into a fortress together, but he is the fortress. Right. He, it, the fortress is a personage. Yeah. It's not just brick and mortar or stone and rock. Uh, one one of the translations there says it's a high and lofty place mm. that is inaccessible by Satan. Ooh. God puts you in there and the devil can't get you. <laughs> he can't he has he has no access to that. God doesn't leave us there. Right. Because he wants to grow us and mature us. Exactly. So he'll let us come into the fortress, his personage in that domain and that dominion and authority and lordship for fellowship. But then he says, let me fill your cup, fill your, you, you with the bread of life, the word of God. And you, down, you go back out and you minister what I've given you. You share this stuff. You know, that's, that's the greatness about the gospel of Christ. Oh, yeah. Personal experiences. Uh, that's why we say we have a testimony. Mm -hmm. You can't have a testimony without a test. Oh, there you go. You know, and, and so God knows when we're weary, we're fatigued and we're, we're tired. He says, come. You know, even Jesus told the disciples they had no leisure so much as to even eat. He said, come, let's go and depart into the mountain where we can at least eat in peace because the phone's always ringing. Somebody's texting them or yeah. Facebooking them or whatever that stuff is. And they're doing all of that stuff. And they, they got to get quiet. You know, God is a God of quietness. Even in Revelation, there's a, there's a half hour oh, space of silence. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and sometimes we get into hustle and bustle and we, we, we just, we're in the throes we're, we're like somebody in a, in a clothes dryer. We're just tumbling, tumbling, tumbling. God says, I want to stop. Open the door. Stop the tumble. Listen to me. You got to get in that fortress. Oh, yes. And, that's, and you, when you read the Old Testament uh, other than Psalm 91, and there's probably some reasons why people, some people believe that Moses may have had a hand in this. They call Psalm 90 and 91 twin psalms. But here's the thing. Everything that happened in the Old Testament was a, was a test with the children of Israel. That's right. Uh, they came to a place and found no water. That's right. Uh, they came to the Red Sea, and it was a dead end. And then uh, the, every time the Bible would say, God did this that he might test them. Right. And so most often... When we go through, like America right now is going through a test. Yes. And we're either going to pass the test or fail the test. But all problems and difficulties and hard times has to be approved by God before he allows them to happen. Not that he causes them, but he will allow uh, people to go through difficult times. He will, uh, he, will, he will allow nations to go through it. And right now, America is going through a time of difficulty, a time of storms, a time of hard times. And uh, you can see it with unemployment. You can see it with what, what's uh, happening in, uh, on uh, the news. It's everywhere. But God will test us as individuals as well. And one writer said that tough times come in order that God may increase our muscle strength, our faith muscles. Right. And, uh, and, and difficult muscle time. And so it, that's just the way it is sometimes. And, uh, but children of Israel, uh, this he said that he might test them. Yes, you, you, when you were talking there, it reminded me of the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, the all, Old Law, and then the New Covenant, the New Testament. Uh, he brought water out of a rock. Mm -hmm. He rained manna down from heaven. But in the New Testament, he says, I am that living water. Ooh. I am the <laughs> bread of life. Yeah. So what he's telling us, what he did in the natural physically for them in the wilderness, I'm doing that for my people, my church, my body now in the spirit. 
John 7, 38. He that believeth in me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. And, and I remember the first time I looked at the pluralization of that. The devil may say to some watching today, your river's gone dry. It doesn't say river. Rivers. It's plural. Right. So if one goes dry, God has more mm. water, more rivers. Uh, and the bread. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. He that believeth on me shall never thirst. And so if we're hungry and we're thirsty, it lets us know we're not where we need to be. God satisfies, Brother Jimmy. Oh, yes. Only God can satisfy a man's or woman's life. That, that's why, regretfully, while in sin, people keep living a life of promiscuity. Well, if I get this woman, I'll be happy. Well, you get her, you're not happy. Or the woman says, if I get this man... He'll make me happy. I'll be fulfilled. That is simply not true. The soul of man is so vast, so large, only God can fill it. And what made the soul so vast was because God breathed into it. And that is eternity. And when God breathed that into Adam, we all are recipients of that. And so you can drink all the liquor. You can smoke all the dope. You can take all the methamphetamines, uh, crack cocaine, uh, fentanyl, you can take all of these drugs, but the next day you're still empty. There's a void of vacuity. Mm. You're just not filled because as I said, the soul of man is so vast, only God can fill that. <laughs> Nothing else. And that's what they're telling us in these Psalms and all of those names. Only God can be the one to satisfy the soul of a man. Man, how beautiful is that? Uh, that reminds me, see, everything you see <laughs> reminds me of something, but uh, they're drawing from the wrong well. True. Uh, in uh, John 4, Jesus told the woman at the well, if you drink of this water, that's right, you'll thirst again. But if you drink of the water that I shall give you, you shall never thirst because I will be a living well of water. Spring it up. Some people are drinking from the well of education. That's right. They think if they can get their degrees in education, they'll be happy and satisfied. Some are draw drawing from the well of, uh, of uh, a f uh, well, uh, an actor or an actress uh, being famous, and they get famous, and then you read somewhere where they took their lives. Then somebody else may uh, drink from uh, the well of something else. But Jesus, you know, when I was a little boy, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take some of them back now a there little you bit. Go. They're not going to understand <laughs> what I'm saying. We had two kinds of wells uh, down south. One was called a picture pump well. And when you got there, they would use to be a little pail of water, and you would have to pour that water in that pitcher pump and pump it at the same time. It was called priming the pump. Right. And you'd prime the pump. But I tell you what you better do before you leave. You better fill that bucket up. Because when you come back, you have to prime the pump again. Right. But we had an artesian well. An artesian well would flow 24 hours a day, wow. seven days a week, 365 days out of a year. It just flowed. It was tapped in to a resource underground that was unlimited in its supply. Wow. Oh, let that's me tell the Holy you Ghost something right, right there. now. This thing is, that's, some people are draw. they have the picture pump mentality. It's true. They have to always be primed, you know, but that artesian well that's, that is plugged into our Lord Jesus Christ, as you've already said, he will satisfy you Amen. like nobody else. I mean, he will satisfy you uh, like no other being can do. Amen. The woman at the well, we sometimes don't appreciate her wisdom. Jesus was analytical, absolutely spiritual, but she had enough wisdom. She said, sir, give me this water. <laughs> I, I want this water oh, yeah. that I thirst not again, and I don't have to come back to this well ever again. <laughs> See, she, she was, he made her thirsty yeah. for what he had. That's right. And, and, of course, he needed water as a man, but as God, he was the living water. Oh, man. You know, but she, she was so wise and not, intriguing him or engaging him in the sense, you, you really don't have this. 
you, you, I've never heard of anything like that. She said, I want it. You give it to me. I want this. You promised to give it to me. And, of course, he did. See? And she went back into the city. She said, come see a man that told me oh, all things yeah. ever I did. Yeah. And he discerned her to a T. Oh, yeah, well, he did. You know? And what most people don't realize, he had a, she was a Samaritan, mongrel. She was a mixed breed. Some take that back to Manasseh and Ephraim, Joseph's two Egyptian children. And so she was halfway in the lineage through Abraham's seed. But the, the great thing about that was she recognized this man has something that I don't have. And what he's telling me, I'm, this will satisfy me. She'd had five husbands. He said, the, the man you're living with now is not your husband. Yeah. So that shows the inability to ever be satisfied. Now, you'd think yeah. after five husbands, you, you might have struck the water or the oil or got, got what yeah. you need. Yep. It, never, it never satisfies. But once she got what Jesus had, she became completely fulfilled and satisfied. This is what's so sad about a lot of people in life today. I preached a message years ago. I made a lady mad. She came right up to me after the service. She said, were you preaching at me? I was preaching on uh, wasted years, how people waste their life, riotous, just like the prodigal son, doing things. And then in the end, they come in. But all of those years were wasted. Uh, how much could have been done for God? You know, we've devoted our lives. God called us from our mother's wombs. But I wasted some years, about five or six years I wasted regretfully. I call those my college years. But God restored that through prayer and fasting and memorizing the scriptures. Uh, he restored that part of my life. But so many people wait too long for the light to come on. And then they've wasted all of this time. But the, you know, the great thing, even though people waste 20, 30, 40, 50 years, God is still a God of redemption. Oh, yeah. You know, maybe you don't, maybe you, maybe you come to only know the Lord when you were in your 70s and you only live 10 more years. And the devil will try to say, see, you wasted your life. It was no good. That might be true up to that point. Right. But after that point, that life and that servitude is no longer wasted. And you never know how God will use you in the end. I'm, I'm anticipating some great moves of God in the very near future, Brother Jimmy. Oh, yeah. He's, uh, he, he's still on the throne, and you can't give up on God. No. And his plan. You know, I know people are going through difficult times. But let me say this. When the Spirit of God has found a place of residence in your heart, there's something in you that will not allow you to give up. It won't allow you to quit. You may slip, stumble, fall, but you will not utterly backslide. David said, though a man fall, he shall not be utterly or totally, completely cast down. Right. For the Lord upholdeth him with oh, his hand. That's God. Psalms 37, 23 yep. through 25. I'm young. I was once young. I'm now old. I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor seed begging bread. So, we may stumble, we may fall, but David said, you are not utterly, totally, completely cast down. Why? Right. God still got his hand on your life. You know, uh, David fell, murdered, committed adultery, but God was there. As soon as David sought to reconcile with God, God restored him. You know, now, just because there's restoration, forgiveness, and redemption, it doesn't ne never negate all that bad stuff that's been sown. That, that's why I wish people could understand. You got to start sowing good seed as quickly as you can. You got to you got to come to the knowledge of Christ. Quit sowing all that bad seed because you will reap it. You will reap all the bad sowing, and that's why it's important for young people to come to Christ at an early age, so they don't have all of that garbage and baggage, and yeah, and they right. take that with them all through life. Yeah. You know, and then when they're middle aged, well, I'm dysfunctional. I come from a broken home, a broken family. I'm this, I'm that. I've been told this. No, no, no. Don't believe that. Don't embrace that. Get in the presence of God and dwell there. Mm. And see, God can wow. heal all of that. Man. He's a healer. Yes, he is. He, he can heal all of the brokenness, all the travesty, all the devastation, all the hurt. You know, life is tough. Yeah. You know, uh, dying is easy. Living is hard. 
Yeah. To, to keep getting through trial after trial after trial and then saying, I'm still not going to quit. I'm not going to capitulate. I am not going to surrender. I'm going to keep on keeping on in spite of it all. And that's what it takes in this hour, Brother Jimmy. Well, that's what somebody said. You're not ready to die until you're ready to live. Amen. When you live in the Lord Jesus, then you're ready to die if it were uh, to happen. But uh, let me sum this first. Let me let me kind of put this first thing uh, behind us and get to the next one. But when you were talking, it reminded me uh, about this first word here, most high, Elon in Hebrew, meaning uh, he's a God of possession. He, he, he possesses it all. This is his world. Yes, it is. He made it. Uh, we have so many questions about why God does this, why God does this. But I heard a little story from a pastor not long ago that might sort of uh, help people w with, with the problems we have. Uh, Job, for instance, you know how he lost his family, farm, finances, uh, lost it all. He had questions, perhaps, I don't know uh, about that, but uh, this, this little story was told by a pastor. I can't, know, uh, see, I can't remember all the details. I'm afraid to really say too much because I might forget the, some of the uh, information. But this woman had gone to the mall and uh, got her a coffee and a magazine and some cookies. And it was a little restaurant sort of in the mall. So she went and sat down, began to read her little magazine, and she would uh, reach over and get a cookie and eat it and drink a little sip of coffee. And um, there was a gentleman right beside her, and he was uh, reading something, but he roast, reached over into that bag <laughs> and got a cookie yeah. and ate it. And she said, well, I may tell you this, the thought of that man eating my cookies. <laughs> and so uh, she didn't say anything, but she sort of gave him a halfway look. And then uh, she got her another cookie and uh, she got a sip of coffee and began to read her book. And after a while, he reached in and got another cookie. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like me. <laughs> yeah. And uh, it, so it went on back and forth. And she said, well, this just beats all I've ever seen. This man's sitting here eating my cookies. <laughs> anyway, she finally just grabbed her magazine and her coffee and her purse and headed out to the parking lot, found her car, and uh, reached in to get her, her keys. And she found her bag of cookies. And she said, oh, my goodness. She was All the time I was eating his cookies. Wow. I thought it was my cookie. <laughs> and let me say, that, say it like this. This world is God's cookies. Amen. He owns it all. Amen. He can do whatever he wants with it. We need to understand that. The biggest thing we need to understand is lesson number one, the first word, most high, the Hebrew word is Elon, and it means that our God owns it all. Absolutely. Number two, the second word is the word almighty, and it's in verse number one. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. That word Almighty is the Hebrew word Shaddai. Almost sounds like shadow. Shaddai, and it means provisions. That is, first one is possession. God owns it all. The second name is provision. When, whenever God, wherever God guides, He provides. Amen. And so He is a God of, uh, that provides. God's uh, Shaddai is not only our; He's not only our banker, but He also signs the checks. Yes, He does. He's our source. Uh, <laughs> I mean, He He is He is our provider. Uh, what can you say about that, Pastor? You know what's amazing that little story. <laughs> That spoke to my heart uh, about presumption. Uh, she thought those were her cookies. Yeah, yeah. And the whole time they were his cookies. And she was, in her mind, condescending 
yep. castigating the man. Right. Who do you think you are? <laughs> and she was completely in the wrong. Yeah. And sometimes we need to, that's a great, that's a great, great, great lesson story because that's a James 1, 19, slow to speak, yep. swift to hear, and slow to wrath. Oh. You know, it, she was fortunate she kept her mouth shut. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Oh, it is. You, because yeah. she would have been totally in the wrong. Uh. But you know what she thought? She thought she was totally right. But when she got to the car, opened up her purse, <laughs> and there was her cookies, she's thinking, oh, my Lord, I'm the one that's at fault. You yeah. know? And sometimes we get presumptuous yep. in so many things. Uh, you know, Job was adamant, if I can get an audience with God, mm. he's going to understand everything oh, I got to say. My goodness, yeah. And when Job did get that audience and vented his little bit of criticism, boy, God lit in on him and said, hey, gird up thy loins like a man, <laughs> for I will demand of thee and answer thou me. Where was that when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declarest thou hast understanding. Can you name all the stars? Can you name the solar systems? And Job <laughs> says, I think I've said too much. I just yeah. put my hand over my mouth because I was presumptuous. Oh. See? And here's where, here's where we struggle as humans. The wisdom of God is so profound. God will take something that is... I, I love to talk about uh, Joseph and, and how God you know, brought 76 souls to Egypt. And God grew a nation, mm. and he made Pharaoh pay for them. Yep. He housed them, he clothed them, and he fed them. Mm. Don't mess with God. Oh, He'll make a goodness. fool out of you. Yes, he will. You know, and, and because he is that God of provision. And how did he provide for Israel? The, the nation of Egypt. They gave them everything they needed. Yeah. So, and then, then Jehokabed, bless her heart. You know, when Pharaoh's daughter found Moses in the bulrushes, Miriam was standing right there. She said, well, this is a Hebrew child. And Miriam said, well, you want me to go get you a, a Hebrew lady to <laughs> yeah. the nursery? She said, yeah, and I'll pay her wages. <laughs> Miriam runs and gets his mama, and she's paid to nurse her baby. Oh, my goodness. What kind of provision is that? Well, he owns it all. Yeah. Made provision for it all. Sent him to the University of Egypt and paid all the bills. <laughs> you know, a thought occurred to me when you said that. I've heard saying that many things are open by mistake, but nothing more frequently than our mouth. Whenever our mouth gets in gear before our mind gets in motion. That's right. Uh, and so, you know, that's kind of what we have to understand is this is God's world. Yes, it is. He owns it all. And he is the almighty. He is the Shaddai. The, uh, he is the provision. And uh, he is the, uh, he's the banker. He's our source. Flip it forward 19. But my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory. And he owns the first national bank on glory Avenue. Amen. He, he does it. He is. God is not a branch manager. <laughs> <laughs> he's at headquarters. That's right. He is the fortress. That's right. Man, I'm going to tell you, he, he, he's stuff, our man. insurance policy. He's our sovereign God. Uh, somebody said tomorrow uh, has two handles. It has the handle of fear and the handle of faith. And you catch it by either handle. And when we face hard times like we have been through in, in America and the world, with COVID-19 and all of the economy and the stock market and all the things that go with that, we need to understand we can respond by fear or we can respond with faith. Uh, somebody said faith honors God and God honors faith. Amen. And so we can choose to be afraid uh, of what's going on or we put our faith in God and believe that he is able to supply all of our needs. You know, a president has a Camp David. I thought that was sort of unique that they named it Camp David. It was named after one of our president's sons. I believe it was Eisenhower. I could be wrong, so don't run reference on it. <laughs> but uh, Camp David was a uh, sort of a secret place. Yes. It was sort of a hideout. 
Right. It was sort of a place to relax and get away from it all for a while. Amen. But yet right here in Psalm 91, oh, Pastor David's already said, he that dwelleth in the secret place, he that dwelleth at the at Camp David, uh, of the most high God, uh, Amen. Uh, of the fortress, his fortress shall abide under the shadow of the almighty. Oh, let me tell you, uh, he, he's our, he's a great God. He owns it all. And so number one, he is our possession. He possesses it all. He owns the leaves and the trees and the fleas and the bees. He is our provider. He's uh, provisions. He's a, he's a great God, and, and that's the second word in uh, these four names of God. The Voice of Evangelism with David Langford is brought to you by the faithful listeners and supporters throughout America. If you're looking for an uncompromising message, we invite you to tune in each week to The Voice of Evangelism. For more information, write to The Voice of Evangelism at P.O. Box 502, Kayser, North Carolina, 28020. That's P.O. Box 502, Kayser, North Carolina, 28020.